The next section of the New Testament is called the General Epistles or Letters. Um, they're sometimes called the Catholic Epistles, and remembering that the word Catholic means part of a whole, these letters have a general application to any Christian community that is a part of that whole. Um, where the letters of Paul were all written to specific people or specific communities to address specific questions or concerns, these general or Catholic letters are intended for a much broader audience. All of Paul's letters bear the name of a person or the community uh, to whom they were written, right? The letter to the Romans, the letter to the Corinthians, uh, the Philippians, the letter to Philemon. Even the pastoral epistles which Paul wrote are named after the recipients, Timothy and Titus. But with these Catholic letters, they all bear the name of their author, Peter, James, John, Jude. With the exception of the letter to the Hebrews, these letters are all named for the person who wrote them, showing us that they are words and witnesses of these specific Christians intended for a vast audience, rather than one person's instructions for a particular person or faith community. These letters take on various forms, but all of them are also different from Paul's letters in that they read more like sermons rather than a formal letter like what you would write to uh, a friend or uh, you know an email that you would compose to someone. Um, these Catholic letters are intended to be preached and circulated in the various places where these general letters were shared. And so having different authors being written to specific different communities um, with the intent of being shared abroad, these letters give us a great insight into the life of faith that was shared among early Christian communities, helping us to now, you know, even 2,000 years later, gain a glimpse into what those closest to the resurrection of Jesus understood it to mean in their lives of faith. Looking at the letters themselves, one stands out as slightly different than the others, and that would be, as I mentioned, the, the letter to the Hebrews. Among the other Catholic epistles, um, this one is written most like a sermon, right? There's no formal greeting or uh, salutation at the end of it like you find, say, in the letters that come from John. Um, there's no indication who wrote this sermon letter, right? It, it, the, the author didn't sign their name at the bottom of it. But it is addressed to the Hebrews. And so that makes us think that it was intended for an audience of Jewish Christians or for Jewish people who uh, it was believed to be might convert to Christianity. Um, Hebrews is definitely longer than the other Catholic epistles that we have. And in the earliest days of the church, many people believe that it mirrored a lot of Paul's writings. And so up until around the year 300, it was lumped in with the other Pauline letters. Um, some of the imagery and the Old Testament references match with what we find in Paul's confirmed writings. But the letter to the Hebrews doesn't include some of the things that Paul emphasized across all of his work, um, particularly the relationship of Jesus' resurrection to Gentiles or non-Jews, right, which is the cornerstone of of Paul's call to be a witness to the Gentiles and his proclamation that the resurrection of Jesus opens up the blessing given to the Jews to those who are not Jewish. And so it's interesting to note just in the placement where we find Hebrews in the New Testament that Hebrews comes between the collection of letters that are attributed to Paul and then the rest of the Catholic or the general epistles. And that reminds us who are non-Jewish Christians, right, of the Jewish heritage that Christianity and the Jesus movement have. And the importance of recalling that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, who, as Paul also insists, is the Messiah sent to bless the entire world, both Jew and Gentile alike.
the content of Hebrews is, is just wonderful, and it shows how the great cloud of witnesses that are God's faithful, uh, as foretold in the stories of the Old Testament, people like Noah and Abraham and David um, and many, many others, all hoped for God's anointed to come and to fulfill God's promise for God's people in the world. Hebrews illustrates how Jesus is the anointed promise fulfillment, how Jesus is the great high priest who carries us as God's people into the presence of God, not just in a temple worship structure like what is found in the Old Testament, but, but through Jesus' own incarnation. Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith, the one who tells us and shows us in his obedience what it means to trust in God's work of resurrection, giving us the assurance of the new life that we hope for in God, and the conviction of those things yet to come, which we now do not yet see fully. It's a wonderful, wonderful sermon letter. And like the rest of Scripture, it's intended to be shared within the life of a Christian community where, where parts of the whole come together to reflect on the history of God's faithfulness and the future of God's work in us through Jesus' resurrection. And so then when we move on to what have always been considered genuine general letters, uh, we come next to the book of James, which is written to the 12 tribes of the diaspora, which means to Jews um, who are spread out from the center that is Israel. They're, they're spread all over um, the known world. And James calls himself a brother and a servant of Jesus. And we remember from the Gospels how Jesus did indeed have siblings, right? And Acts tells us that James, the brother of Jesus, was one of the early leaders of the Jerusalem church um, alongside the other 12 disciples. James... Uh, and, and the letter of James in particular, seems to stand apart, particularly from Paul's letters, by advocating for the importance of observing Torah, or the Jewish law, and the necessity of uh, Christians doing good works. Martin Luther noticed this distinction and thought, um, even though he respected James's place in Scripture, uh, he, he put James kind of as an appendix to the heart of the New Testament, right? Because James is famous for the verse uh, which reads that faith without works is dead, linking the trust that we have in God's work of Jesus' resurrection with the transformation that God works in God's people to carry out good works. Not as a requirement of faith, but as an expression of what faith does for us. And... Um, even though Paul makes that case in his letters, his case for good works and, and, and doing good works as, as, as a part of what it means to be a Christian um, are implied. They're not directly focused on. What's focused on in Paul's letters are God's work in Jesus and the faith, the trust that we have in that work. And so even though they're different, they're complementary. They go together. Um, James emphasizes that faithful obedience and this service through good works because he wants us to encourage one another uh, to be patient and to persevere in the face of trials and temptations, right? Encouraging Christians not to hide away in fear, but to boldly trust in Jesus by serving those in need, regardless of the target it may put on our backs. Right. James helps us to connect the faith that we have in God with the love we express toward our neighbor, the people whom God loves and calls us to serve. Next comes the letters of First and Second Peter, um, which are attributed to the apostle himself right, and to those who followed him in the way of Jesus most closely. First Peter is written to God's chosen resident aliens scattered throughout the region of Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. 
Um, Peter is also concerned with encouraging these Christians to remain steadfast and hopeful in the face of persecution. Remembering that just as Israel was exiled in Babylon, the church is now in its own exile as we await our final homecoming into the presence of God. Jesus comes to liberate us all from captivity, be it God's faithful from Babylon, you and I from the brokenness of a sinful world, or the spirits in prison, those who have died and now lay captive in the bonds of death in the grave. Jesus has come to release us all through his resurrection promise. And so, even though persecution finds us, we wait patiently and we remain steadfast in the faith, trusting that God has come to set us free from these and all things which hold us fast. The letter of Second Peter shares similar wording with the epistle of Jude, which is another general letter we're going to talk about here in a minute. Um, and Second Peter encourages Christians to continue growing in their faith, uh, trusting that God and God's promises that were spoken by the prophets and the apostles, right? The, the people of the Old Testament who called people back to God's promises and the people of the New Testament who are called to point to the promise fulfilled in Jesus, right? That these prophets and apostles, they are trustworthy, warning against false teachers and others who contradict the message that God's prophets and apostles teach about Jesus. A theme is developing here, right? In that, you know, the early church, for all of the wonderful things that must have been going on by the Spirit through them, was a church that faced persecution from all sides. From without, from people who wanted to arrest them and throw them in prison and, uh, you know, keep the message of Jesus' resurrection under a tight lid. And from within people who saw the movement and the momentum behind it and wanted to take it for themselves. And so they started introducing um, false witness about who God is and what God does through Jesus and how uh, those closest to Jesus and those who learned from him and from the witness of scripture what his life, death, and resurrection meant uh, had to endure for the sake of keeping that teaching solid and true to what it is in Jesus. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a pattern that I, th I think we, in our modern day, sometimes take for granted because of the way in which the church finds itself situated uh, in a place of privilege, particularly in the Western world, where it's not a persecuted religion, um, where there are many, many ideas about what it means to be faithful you know, and not just faithful to Jesus, but faithful in general. And so keeping the core of the message about God and God's work in Jesus um, is just as urgent for us today as it was for these first Christians, but we experience that, um, that call, that call to witness to God's saving power and God's truth in a different way because the world in which we live is so different. Which is important then to take us to the next letter, right? The the three letters of John, uh, first, second, and third John. Um, these three letters actually don't bear John's name. John didn't sign his name at the bottom of these, uh, just like the uh, the author of Hebrews didn't sign his or her name. Um, but all three of these letters do agree in terms of language and content with one another. Um, it looks like linguistically the same person wrote all three letters. Um, and, you know, it, it also gives credence to the fact that these three letters were saved and passed around. And, um, you know, so they must have come from someone important and someone who had a standing within the church to be able to speak authoritatively. And that they agree and that they were saved um, and that they shared themes and contents and, and language with one another gives us. Um, a good reason to believe that the same person wrote all three. And beyond that, they share similar themes and language and content with the Gospel of John. 
And so in the earliest days of the church, even though these three letters didn't have a name attached to them as, as far as an author goes, um, it leads us to believe that John, the evangelist, John, the author of the gospel, wrote both the gospel text and these three letters as well. Um, primary, you know, among the themes that are shared among the gospel and these three letters are the themes of Jesus as the word of God, the, the son of God, and the essence of God's love, emphasizing Jesus' divinity, his incarnation, and not just that God is loving, but God is love. And that particularly comes from uh, 1 John, which is written to fellow Christians just in general. And this letter skips back and forth between being a letter, right, some kind of a formal exchange between multiple parties, and a sermon with a great big emphasis on what it means that God is love and how Jesus is the embodiment, the enfleshment of divine love that has been given to the world so that we may know what love is and in turn love one another. All right, and so in this letter of 1 John, you hear connections, particularly to John 3.16, but the entire stretch of the gospel text as well. Um, the second letter of John is written specifically to um, the elect lady and her children, who, it, 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 it's unknown who this person is. It may be a specific Christian woman and her children. It may be a female leader of a local church and those who gather to worship and serve alongside her. Um, or it could be to the lady that is Christ's church, right? A more general audience. Um, and all of its members, the children, those who find themselves within the body. Um, we were not really sure, but this, this short little one-page letter that is 2 John encourages its audience to be wary of those who deny that Jesus was not God in the flesh, right? That, that believe that Jesus was just um, some kind of spirit or ghost from God. Encouraging... Christian believers, because of Jesus' incarnation, to love one another by following Jesus' commandments, right? The importance that Jesus is both fully God and fully human, so that we humans might know what it means to be in the presence of God by sharing God's love with one another. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful little piece of scripture that, that has so much insight into what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And then the third letter of John. Third John is also another very, very short text. It, it, it takes up about a page. Um, and it's written to uh, a man named Gaius, uh, whom John encourages to share generous and extravagant hospitality to others, um, especially to those who work to spread the good news of Jesus. Gaius is told to welcome missionaries into his home, to feed them, to offer them support and whatever nature they may need it so that they can continue the work of spreading the good news of Jesus. Um, it shows us not only how we are called to treat others in general, um, welcoming all people into the embrace of God's love, but also how we are called to lift up and support those who witness for the sake of the gospel. How we welcome other Christians into our midst and nurture them and support them so that their ministry and their part of the work in which we all share um, might be as fruitful as possible. Um, reminding us also that, you know, be it a fellow Christian worker for Jesus or another stranger we meet on the street who may not share our same faith, um, it's important to welcome one another with generosity and hospitality rather than cutting people off and keeping people out and away from us because they may be different than us or, you know, even more popular than us, right? Because we don't like to be upstaged by others. How, how as Christians, the nature of what it means to be in Christ also it, it means to be in community with others whom God loves. Um, and then I mentioned the book of Jude, uh, the letter 
the letter of Jude. It, and it's the final uh, letter of the New Testament right before we get to the book of Revelation, which we'll talk about in another video. Um, and, and Jude is written by Jude, who calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Um, and so, you know, recognizing that there are many James listed throughout um, the Gospels and Acts as either um, disciples or relatives of Jesus or other followers of Jesus and members of the community at large, um, and, and even the author of the letter of James that we just talked about briefly, um, it leads us to believe that, that Jude, the author of this letter, and the author of the letter of James are siblings. Um, you know, it's really hard to tell now 2,000 years removed, but we give thanks for the witness of leaders like Jude who uh, did what they could faithfully to share their witness to Jesus with the people whom they met. And so similar to Second Peter, in fact, Second Peter shares, you know, much of what Jude had written in his own letter. He, he quotes almost, Second Peter quotes almost half of Jude um, you know, in, in that letter. Um, the letter of Jude encourages people to beware of false teachers and to turn to what the apostles and the prophets have already shared about Jesus, keeping in mind that they are indeed trustworthy, right? That, that what has been said and what has been taught through the continuous line of witness that is God's people is something that we can trust in because it is God speaking to us. And to be leery of those who uh, deviate from that truth that is God's love poured out for us in Jesus. Uh, and so that's a lot, right? Because these general letters are written for a general audience and uh, have uh, a number of ways that you and I even now can learn from and grow from their witness in Scripture. Um, these, these general letters seem heavily focused on encouraging the church to remain steadfast in the faith. Right? In spite of false teachings cropping up, uh, in spite of persecutions that threaten their lives, in spite of temptations that threaten to keep them and us from God's desire for us. These letters serve as a reminder that in the early days of the church, uh, the Jesus movement was fraught with real dangers that many of us in today's modern world just don't have to endure. But they also speak of the strength and the courage and the conviction which the resurrection promise of Jesus provides for those who are undergoing great trials. It's a wonderful promise that we share, right? We, we all share as part of a whole the wonderful promise of Jesus' resurrection life. And so when we do encounter hardship, uh, when we are tempted to turn away from God, when we are confronted with teachings that deny God's love for us in Jesus, we know now in this time and in this place because of these letters that we are not alone and that God will sustain us in these and all things just as God has done for the saints of the past.